Good morning. morning. Welcome to Hope Unitarian Church. I'm the Reverend Justin McCreary. I'm the minister serving Hope. Uh, I'm very excited that you made your way up the hill this morning, and I'm very glad to see all your faces. I look forward to hearing what the choir has for us and look forward to connecting with all of you. Now, as a faith, Unitarian Universalists are covenantal, not creedal, built on the principle that all human beings deserve to be treated with dignity, which leads up to seeking justice and equity for all people. We welcome you regardless of race, creed, or sexual identity and hope that you'll find a place within us here, with us here where we need not think alike to love alike. Before we do our opening song, I did want to make a special... Uh, I wanted to read the response from the UUA regarding the violence that took place in Pennsylvania yesterday. This was the UUA's response, and I believe and I agree with it wholeheartedly. Unitarian Universalism believes in the right of free speech and the democratic process. Attacks like those on Saturday's political rally weaken democracy, and the Unitarian Universalist Association condemns this attack. At a time when democracy is already at risk, these events will only make our political environment more precarious. As we prepare to meet this moment, we must return to our spiritual grounding and faithful practice. Take a breath reflect together, wait for the emerging truth over quick speculation, anchor yourselves in commitments and relationships that foster resilience, wisdom, political analysis, and spiritual grounding as misinformation will be rampant. Our Unitarian Universalist tradition is rooted in the values of human dignity, justice, compassion, and democratic principles. We will remain vigilant in our commitment to protecting our democracy and the integrity of the principles and the rights of all its people. Let us keep at, uh, love at the center and we, because we are all in this together. At this time, I will invite you to rise and body your spirit as you feel so called to sing our opening song. It is our tradition to light a chalice at the beginning of each service, and we use these words as we light the chalice. We light this beacon of hope, sign of our quest for truth and meaning, in celebration of the life we share together. You may be seated. My invocation this morning is called Building the Justice We Long For by Reverend Scott Taylor. May this flame cast its light toward better days, reminding us that the future is not simply a place we are going, but a place we are creating. The path of new possibilities will not be found, but made. The justice we long for does not sit at the end of the inevitable arc. It lies in the, bend, in the bending that is ours to do. A new world is waiting to be built. Friends, May our time together light our way. And as we are a covenantal faith, let's say our covenant together. Love, love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek truth in love, and to help one another. At this time, we will sing our first hymn together. And that is hymn number 1008, if you're in the hymnal. But I would invite you to rise in body or spirit as you feel so called as we sing when our heart is in a holy place. Where is the 
us in each other's arms. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in a holy place, when we tell our stories from Listen with a loving mind, and we hear our voices in each other's words. When our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, when our heart is in a holy place, we are blessed with love. and I have a few announcements to share. A reminder that Tuesday, July 16th, Connie Seibolt's memorial service will be held at Zero Point at 1 o'clock. And if you're a, a new member or if you're just interested, there's a Roots of Unitarian Universalism uh, course, a boot camp, Re Reverend Justin calls it, at, uh, on July the 20th, so make a note, at 9 a.m., if you plan on coming to that, please let me know because I need to know how many uh, orders to print out. For stuff. Okay. How much stuff. Okay. So the Lunch Bunch meets this week, and they're meeting at Tiamo's, one of my favorite places, best bruschetta ever. And uh, call Mary Beard. It's 1130 on Wednesday at uh, 6024 South Sheridan. And game night is July 18th. The potluck is at 6, and the games begin at 6.30, and Emily is the person you need to con contact about that, Emily Scherer. And since Emily isn't here, you can also contact me if you have questions. Okay, talk to James. And if you don't want Larry Vanver on your butt, you need to sign up for the, Amer uh, the mayoral accountability session. He has... Uh, 23 people signed up so far because I looked and he needs 25 and it's on July 28th Sunday at 3 p.m. and if you were in the session this morning I was very impressed with the specificity that the Action Committee is addressing needs that are real in the community and making candidates accountable for their actions. I was very impressed with what she had to say, and we are supporting them uh, so, at, all the time. So um, see Larry Vanderbilt after church if you want to. Or Gail Hall. Or Gail Hall, excuse me, Gail too. And uh, in the help wanted area, we need a waterer for the front flower bed. And if you've been looking at the flowers as you come in, they're lovely, and we want to keep them that way, but we need a volunteer to water on Wednesdays and see Carol, if you can do that. And then a reminder, this is because I'm an English teacher, if, you're, if you are planning to participate in the band book club, you need to start reading today, <laughs> The Bluest Eye, because I haven't started, so I'm starting today <laughs> to read The Bluest Eye, and it's uh, mid-August is when we'll be discussing that in adult forum. And Anita has something she wants to speak about.
Hi, I'm Anita Ward, and I'm the chair of the Outreach Committee. One wonderful thing that I think this church does once a month is we cook and provide food for the Day Center for the Homeless. And, you know, in the past, we, we would actually go and serve it. And for a while, we just, you know, during COVID days, we would deliver it only, and they would serve it. But we're back to serving. And the last time we did this, there was a pitiful number of us. So we, I mean, we didn't get to serve. I mean, we just had to let them do it. I have a list out on the uh, long table, taped. Please sign up to help uh, serve on this Saturday. How many uh, do you need? Uh, there's a list. <laughs> this many to serve, uh, one to help me and Janet get the food <laughs> in, the, in our vehicles. It uh, takes an hour. Yeah, it's very, uh, one to do drinks. I mean, it's pretty, one to wash the dishes, you know, it's pretty spe specific. But I, I, it's very uh, rewarding, I think, when you see how appreciative they are of of getting a meal, and, and a good meal, I might add. <laughs> Thanks. Meditation this morning is entitled, In These Times in Which the Ground Feels Shaky, by Reverend Joan Javier Duval. In these times in which the ground feels shaky, and our hands and feet unsteady, we turn to you, O source of strength, spirit of compassion, for we do not know what the future holds, truly we can never know. And we need strength in these times of uncertainty. We need the strength and the fortitude to hold on, to see clearly, and reach out in love. May we find guidance within ourselves and beyond ourselves. May we be restless for truth when truth is cast aside. May we be seekers of peace as the drumbeats of war grow louder around us. May we hear and sound the alarm for our planet as fires rage and ravage. And in all this, may love rule our hearts. May we know the source of love within us and stay grounded in that source. As we grieve, as we grapple with the unknown, as we work towards creating a more just, peaceful, and sustainable present and future together, so may it be. Amen.
The reading is from James Luther Adams, and it's called Social Responsibility. In 1927, in the city of Nuremberg, six years before the nation socialists came into power, I was watching a Sunday parade on the occasion of the annual mass rally of the Nazis. Thousands of youth, as a sign of their vigor and patriotism, had walked from various parts of Germany to attend the mass meeting of the party. As I watched the parade, which lasted for four hours and which was punctuated by trumpets and drum corps made up of hundreds of Nazis, I asked some people on the sidelines to explain the meaning of the swastika, which decorated many of the banners. Before long, I found myself engaged in a heated argument. Suddenly, someone seized me from behind and pulled me by the elbows out of the group, which I was arguing, and in the firm grip of someone whom I could barely see, I was forced through the crowd and propelled down a side street up into a dead-end alley. As this happened, I assure you, my palpitation rose quite perceptibly. I was beginning to feel Nazism existentially. At the end of the alley, my uninvited host swung me around quickly, and he shouted at me in German, you fool, don't you know? In Germany today, when you are watching a parade, you either keep your mouth shut or you get your head bashed in. I thought he was going to bash it in right there. But then his face changed into a friendly smile, and he said, if you had continued with the argument for five minutes longer, those fellas would have beaten you up. Why did you decide to help me, I asked. And he replied, I am anti-Nazi. I saw you there getting into trouble, and I thought of the times when in New York City, as a sailor of the German Merchant Marine, I received wonderful hospitality. And I said to myself, here is your chance to repay that hospitality. So I grabbed you, and here we are. And I'm inviting you home to Sunday dinner.
uh, a, due to the events of Saturday, I wrote a pre-introduction to the introduction of my sermon. So if they don't line up right, that's why. Uh, throughout much of this sermon, I'll be talking about totalitarianism and referencing James Luther Adams, whose views were formed during his time spent in the confessing to anti-Nazi seminaries in Germany during the rise of the Third Reich. But following the events of yesterday, I wish to affirm that we are not in Nazi Germany. We have before us options. Even when it looks hopeless, it's important to remember that we must work peacefully to make the change we want to make. So it's easy to look at history and see a series of unconnected, isolated events. But when we really focus, what we find is that history is a connected, interlocking web. And though distance covers this web, it is all connected. It's, an e uh, it's easy to look at people, to see them as isolated bobs floating in a great ocean. But if we pan out of those isolated bobs to the horizon, we notice that these isolated bobs, uh, these isolated bobs are constantly moving with each other, moving with waves and constantly bumping into each other, causing their neighbors to move. And even within the physical reality of matter, we carry atoms and molecules that, that were present in the Big Bang, and we swap them on a global scale. Our oceans are affected by the pull of the moon, and the moon is held aloft by inertia and the gravity that keeps it circling the Earth. Earth is held aloft by that same power and forces, uh, that powerful force as it circles the sun. We are pushed and pulled by many great forces. Some of them we can't control, but many of them we carry within ourselves the power to put pressure on these forces in a way we can control. We're not alone. We're part of something much greater than ourselves, a cosmos that binds and is bound by these invisible forces. But as I began, it's easy to look at history like a series of unconnected, isolated events. But when we focus, what we find is that history is connected like an interlinking web. We then are shaped by this web, but we all aren't shaped the same way. We are shaped in regard to where we live on this web. Unitarian scholar James Luther Adams talked about being in Nuremberg in 1927, six years before the Nazi party came to power. After watching a four-hour parade filled with trumpets and uh, runs of young people marching, Adams asked one of the onlookers what the meaning of the swastika was. I'm sure that Adams began hearing about uh, what it meant to be a pure German. I'm sure he heard distressing things about Jews, immigrants, Catholics, and other groups. He probably heard about how they were infesting Germany and that they were the reason that Germany had its troubles at all. And if in one fell swoop they were to get rid of all of these groups, they would be better off. Sometime after the shouting began, right, the two Adam, uh, between two of them, Adams felt someone pull him aggressively out of the crowd and deposit him in a back alley. And he was told, you fool, don't you know, in Germany today, when you're watching a parade, you either keep your mouth shut or you get your head bashed in. If you had continued that argument for five minutes longer, those fellows would have beaten you up. Later, he would go to Sunday dinner with his fellow, and he would learn that different parts of the government and various organizations around Germany were being coerced into Nazism. One of the things that strikes me so adeptly when I read this story is that this is close to 12 years before the invasion of Poland. And 14 years before the United States and Great Britain would enter the war. 
In an article entitled, The Evolution of My Social Concern, he would go on to say that he often heard anti-Nazis say, if only a thousand of us in the late 20s had combined in heroic resistance, we could have stopped Hitler. And it's important to remember, giving, uh, in regard to that statement, that what Adams is talking about is not violence. When he talks about heroic resistance, he, isn't, he, he means working with voluntary associations, like trade unions and religious organizations, working together to fight totalitarianism through their institutions, not through physical harm. He believed that liberal faith should express itself in society, in education, economics, social organization, and political organization. Adams never seeks to incite violence. Adams very much believed it was through our relationships with these institutions that tips the scale away from totalitarianism. And he goes on to say, a faith that is not the sister of justice is bound to bring people grief. It thwarts creation, a divine given possibility. It robs them of their birthright of freedom in an open universe. It robs the community of their spiritual richness latent in its members. It reduces the person to a beast of burden in, uh, in, slavish, in a slavish subservience to the state, a church, or a party to God that made the human hands. And just recently, but I can go back to the beginning of that, and I would like to say my favorite part of that is when he says, a faith that is not the sister of justice is bound to bring people grief. Just recently, the UUA as a whole voted to adopt Article 2, and by, highlighting, by doing this, they highlighted seven values that they believe describe Unitarian Universalism for everybody. One of those values is justice. And they define what they mean by justice when they do this. What they say is, we work to be a diverse, multicultural, beloved community where all thrive. We covenant to dismantle racism in all forms of systemic oppression. We support the use of inclusive democratic processes to make decisions. I believe that we are a faith committed to justice. I believe that we are a church committed to justice. And I believe that we are a people committed to justice. But the problem is sometimes we have a hard time seeing what justice might be. I started this sermon talking about webs and bobbers on the ocean, not just the idea that we're all part of an inter interdependent web, but the idea that history is also part of an interconnected web. There is little doubt that there is a reorientation going on in this country, but I would argue that this is nothing new. I've lost count of all the anti-trans and anti-LGBTQ legislation that I have seen in my lifetime. I've lost count of how many times Roe v. Wade has been attacked in my lifetime. And what I learned from Roe v. Wade is that anything can happen if you get the right group of people together. I am more commonly hearing frustration and fear come up by many marginalized communities, especially the women who fear uh, access to health care since the repealing of Roe v. Wade. I never thought I would live through a time when I had to be nervous when I would just to argue or just to say that black lives do matter in that systemic racism, racism is problematic. But see, this isn't new. I can draw a line from the white Southern strategy of the 1970s to the idea that civil rights legislation can be inter, uh, under, uh, undermined through dog whistle politics and the redrawing of lines on election maps directly to the system of oppression leading to African-American males unable to vote, to Citizens United, and to the gutting of the civil rights movement in the repeal of Roe v. Wade. I can draw a line from the white Southern strategy to those things. Kevin Phillips was one of Nixon's chief strategists and said this, from now on, the Republicans are never going to get more than 10 to 20% of the Negro vote. 
And they don't need any more than that, but Republicans would be short-sighted if they weakened enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. The more Negroes who register as Democrats in the South, the sooner the Negrophobe whites will quit the Democrats and become Republicans. That's where the votes are. Without the prodding from the blacks, the whites will backslide into their old, uh, into their old comfortable arrangement with local Democrats. Um, just a question, does anyone know what I mean when I say the white Southern strategy? There are a few. We're gonna go on here for a minute, but it was a concept, it was a political concept that came up in the 1970s around the uh, election of Nixon and was mainly used during the election of Reagan to change the South. But let, I'll get to that. The idea was that increasing marginalizations would, increasing marginalization would solidify a voting bloc in the American South. Decreasing mar or increasing marginalization would create a voting bloc. It would change the South. This way, one can create a group within a group that can manage authority while continuing to minimize the power of the very marginalized groups. The process was identified by a gentleman named Lee Atwater in 1981 that wasn't published until 1990. So this is where I'm going to use an Atwater quote to explain what the white Southern strategy is, or the Southern strategy that became very important during the late 70s in the 1980 election. This is a brutal quote that I'm going to give. I am redacting a lot of words in this quote because it was not made by someone who is like-minded with a Unitarian Universalist. But it's a very important quote. So Lee Atwater says this in an interview. Y'all don't quote me on this. And if you begin an interview saying, don't quote me on this, you know it's going to be bad. <laughs> and it's going to be bad. He says, you start out in 1954 by saying, he says, N-word, N-word, N-word. By 1968, you can't say that anymore because it hurts you. It backfires. So you stay, say stuff like forced busing, states' rights, and all that stuff. You're getting so abstract now that you're talking about cutting taxes, and all these things you're talking about uh, are totally economic things, and the byproduct of them is that blacks get hurt worse than whites. And subconsciously, maybe that's part of it. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that if it is getting that abstract and that coded, that we are doing away with the racial problem one way or another. You follow me? Because obviously sitting around saying we want to cut this is much more abstract than even the busing thing. And a hell of a lot more abstract than, and he uses the N word again twice. So it seems at the time, this party didn't really want the black vote. The idea was to use coded language to organize white people in one space, to organize white people around other ideals. And you'll see this during the election in 1980 in Neshoba County, Mississippi, when Ronald Reagan begins talking about welfare queens and being, a, uh, being tough on being, uh, being a law and order president. These words became dog whistles. It's not, un or it's very clear that yes, they're trying to get around being called racist in this, con in this concept, but are one, acting that way, but intending to harm a specific part of the population. Over time, with affiliation to the religious right, words like heritage and family values became dog whistles against the LGBTQ community. Today, I can look back like, like I'm, I'm following or tying a thread. And the problem is the thread is only visible backwards. But that doesn't mean it's not there. And we still see how this thread continues. And we will see how this thread continues through Project 2025. It reminds me of another quote by James Luther Adams. 
The prophetic liberal church is a church in which all members share a common responsibility to attempt to foresee the consequences of human behavior with the intention of making history in a place of mere in place of merely being pushed around by it. This is the prophetic liberal church. That's what we are. In which all members share a com we we share a common responsibility to foresee the consequences of human behavior. This is what he would explain prophecy is. The next part of the sermon that we're going into, by the way, is where we deal with the other section of justice. We're going to talk about a little bit about equity. Now, equity is another one of those values that was defined by the UUA as core to Unitarian Universalism. And they tell you what they, need, what they mean by equity, too. They say this, we declare that every person is inherently worthy and has the right to flourish with dignity, love, and compassion. We covenant to use our time, wisdom, attention, and money to build and sustain fully accessible and inclusive communities. But those opening words, we declare that every person is inherently worthy and has the right to flourish. See, equity calls us not just to action, but to a change in perspective. We live in a very competitive world, in a very competitive system. We're told to look out for ourselves. We answer the question Cain asks of God in Genesis every day, am I my brother's keeper? And I ask the question to you. Because what we're looking at in the world, what we're looking about with Unitarian Universalist values is that if someone is to ask me, am I my brother's keeper, the answer is yes. But when Cain asked the question of God, Cain's implied answer was no. We are the keepers of our neighbors, our brothers, and our sisters. What does it mean that people are inherently worthy? How do we help them flourish with dignity? How do we look out into the system in which we're a part? How do we look at the starving child and cut free lunch? How do we look toward the loved ones, our loved ones in the LGBTQ community who think the only uh, safety that they may have is to flee this state and maybe even this country regarding the outcome of an election. And it's the same with women who are now afraid to become pregnant or unable to get benefits that they need to survive because of the repeal of Roe versus Wade. How do we flourish in this system? How do we become our brother and sister's keeper when a system keeps trying to push them down? What does it mean for us if we are inclusive of these people? So as I said, we are not in Nazi Germany. We have a chance to make change by our vote through our free elections. But it's more than voting. It's not just voting. It's organizing. It's learning. It's going to action events. It's understanding how power structures work and what it takes for people with little money to build power so that they may seek their own justice. So we are not in necessarily being their saviors so that we are giving them what they need to thrive with dignity. Because for Unitarian Universalist justice invokes our intention to build the beloved community through democracy. And equity reminds us that any beloved community we build must treat everyone with inherent worthiness. I come before you this morning reminding you that we are part of a democratic system, that we adhere to the democratic value, that we and I'm asking you to use that system. We don't just sit and we don't just watch. We organize, we look, we listen, and we figure out where we are so that we can truly answer the question, 
Am I my brother's keeper? And say yes. Because regardless of what a business tells you, regardless of what culture tells you, regardless of what your cousins may tell you, your aunts or your uncles, it matters what happens to others. It matters what happens to them. Uh, and we are responsible for creating a world where they can be treated with inherent worthiness, with dignity, so that they may thrive. So I invite you into this world of justice and equity that doesn't simply ask the question, what is right, but ask the question, what can I do to help make right happen? Thank you. In many ways, we're a very blessed congregation, and we understand that when we go out into the world. We're blessed with a little bit more safety, a little bit more security than a lot of the people around us. And one of the ways that we seek justice and one of the ways that we seek equity for people is by giving donations, not just to the congregation, but we choose a generosity recipient every month. And extra donations if you write a check and you write generosity in the memo line it'll go towards our generosity recipient if you put cash in the uh, basket it'll go towards the generosity recipient everything else goes to the operating fund but one of the ways we create power is by creating a stable financial income and this is how we do that as a church so i ask everyone to give with hope <coughs> for a future that we build this beloved community together. Our generosity recipient this month is the Dennis R. Neal Equality Center at Oklahomans for, uh, for Equality. And I would ask that you give with hope and love for the future.
Let's give thanks for the offering. We build on foundations we did not lay. We warm ourselves at fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. We profit from persons we did not know. We are ever bound in community. Our final hymn will be hymn number 121. This is one of my favorite hymns, We'll Build a Land. And I think it's one of the ones that's the easiest to just belt out loud. So if you would all rise in body or spirit as you feel so called, let's belt this one out there. service we choose uh, we light our chalice in our light at the beginning of service and we extinguish at the end with these words we extinguish this flame but not the light of truth the warmth of community or the fires of commitment these we carry in our hearts until we are together again so come build a land 
And as we go forward, remember to build the land, remember to go in peace, remember to seek hope in the darkness. Let's sing our going forth. Thank you.